what up folks what it do welcome to another episode of the best advice ever podcast yeah with your boy comedian mike goodwin the bowtie comedian shout out to father's day man father's day was recently had a very very great father's day one of my favorite things to be in the world is a father i often start every episode with a segment called the mind of mike i want to share this with you i am a big sports guy i really love basketball primarily i'm a basketball basketball hashtag basketball life or hashtag basketball gang whatever that basketball is and that could be college basketball the nba the wnba high school basketball i enjoy a spirited game of hoops now i don't i don't hoop much my Achilles is torn, and then my shoulder, which has a lot to do with activities on the basketball court, whether that's shooting, passing, or dribbling, often tells me, hey, man, how about you have a seat? Let's go focus on some activities that are a little less dynamic in nature. So don't play as often as I like, but I enjoy basketball. But I love to be engaged with sports, especially if it's something from the University of South Carolina. I'm all things University of South Carolina. So if there's a softball game on and the University of South Carolina is playing, I'm in. Baseball, I'm in. Football, in. Twiddly winks, in. So my super, my love for South Carolina allows me to watch sports that I typically would not watch. Uh, American football i i don't have a team nfl wise i'm i'm a a reluctant minnesota vikings fan that's kind of because i grew up with a father that loved the vikings basketball again don't necessarily have teams I, i like different players but what happens when you enjoy sports people often want to talk sports i don't talk sports with everybody first off it used to be a rule of mine i I think the rules kind of i've lessened the rule because i don't really know nowadays but i used to not have conversations with people about sports that we're not good at sports like what are we even talking about because sometimes those folks are the, the most unreasonable like you can't even dribble with your left hands how you out here criticizing LeBron James I don't ideologically I don't get that it just come on man like let's be humble let's have a little bit of grace when having conversations so the conversation around athletes nowadays I don't I don't like it man I don't like it you got folks that sit on the radio on television and they pontificate about things that they've never accomplished. And and I'm not saying that there's no room for analysis and observation and, and having a critical a critical evaluation of, of, of a thing, of a game, of a performance. But sometimes this stuff feels very personal. And I, I'm not for, I don't know these people. I don't know LeBron James. I don't know Michael Jordan. I don't know Kobe Bryant. I, I don't know these people personally, so I'm not going to get myself tied up in emotional knots arguing. And I learned this as a young fella in Camden, South Carolina. I'm not sure if I've ever told the story, but I grew up as, well, I told that story, as a Minnesota Vikings fan, but I, I had a friend of mine who was a huge Chicago Bears fan. He may have been Chicago bears bulls that's the interesting thing about growing up in south carolina we we truly 
don't have a franchise professionally to follow, there may be folks that grow up attaching their allegiance to the Braves because the Braves were three hours away. I'm thinking about a buddy that listens to the podcast. He's a big Falcons fan. Not really sure about baseball or even Hawks. I, I don't, I'm not very certain, but I know that they are people that grew up in South Carolina that are huge Atlanta fans because Atlanta was the closest professional market to South Carolina. Then there's some Dallas Cowboys fans. Those folks supersede geographic location. So those people, you'll find those people anywhere. Then there's some Charlotte. There's some, there's some Panthers fans that by the time the Panthers arrived, I was a full formed adult. So it's kind of hard for me to be on board. I'm not mad at the, the Panthers. I, I've kind of looked at what they've been doing the last couple of years. Very, very confused, very bewildered. Uh, the same shoe for the, for the Hornets. I, I would have been, I think that would have been the NBA. I don't know. I, I was, a, I was there. I mean, I had some, I had some Charlotte Hornet Converse basketball sneakers. But then they moved to Orle- uh, New Orleans, and then they became the Bobcats. And then we – ah, so there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance. It's a, I'm not quite Carolina, North Carolina. North Carolina people think they're better than South Carolina people, which that's another podcast for a different day. But I learned this lesson from my friend, Ricky Brown. Interesting enough – Ricky and I would get into these debates about sports often. I was Chicago Bears. He was a Chicago Bears fan. I'm a Minnesota Vikings, so we get into arguments. I think Ricky was a Bulls fan, but Ricky, I learned, was not a reasonable fan. Ricky was something. He was a trailblazer way before his time. Ricky was a troll. Ricky didn't care about the debate what we were saying, Ricky liked to get under people's skin. And I realized this at some point in middle school. It might have been the seventh or eighth grade. I remember having this back and forth, and it seemed like the more heated it got, the more excited Ricky got, and the more confused I got. Because I'm like, this is my friend. I'm not about to be arguing with my buddy about sports that neither one of us are that great in anyway. Ricky was quite the athlete as in general. I think he was a basketball guy, not as much football was his main thing, but I think Ricky played baseball. Ricky's one of these guys that played football well into his forties, I would suspect, and, and not in the NFL. I think Ricky went to college and played at a small school. And I don't I don't know if he graduated and I don't think he graduated. But then he just always played, whether they were these adult leagues. I mean, I'm talking about football pads and helmets. And they were not professional leagues. Maybe some of them were indoor arena, some type of thing. But it, it, it's similar to basketball like I got a buddy of mine that plays in a lot of leagues but I think leagues are a little bit different in basketball than football because football you are you give a little bit more than sweat equity like if I went and played basketball I mean I'm gonna be you know it's 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 rigorous it's difficult but if I'm catching a, a slant across the middle that those I can't I can't uh <laughs> <laughs> undo that hit like you are getting plummeled you are getting tackled after maybe 18 I don't think I was in for tackling unless I was tussling with a young lady but separate from that I didn't desire to be tackled but Ricky Brown I would see Facebook post and he would Playing in these 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 grown man shoulder pads and helmet leagues, 
And that's that he loved it. He loved it. But what Ricky also loved was agitating and aggravating people in sports conversations. So I learned from Ricky to not argue with people about sports. Because some people are just trolls. Some people don't, they have an opinion, but they they get they love getting people worked up. I I can be trolly. I can be trollish. I have a little bit of troll, especially if it's certain people. There's a person in my, in my life that I I don't know. I feel compelled to troll sometimes. It's very, it's very confusing. So I get it. But that's why my good one, I don't know why I'm speaking in third person. I don't get into conversations about sports. I don't, that's not my, my cup of tea. And I would much rather us have a reasonable, informative interaction, which I'll talk a little bit more about another topic later. I would want to walk away with a little bit more understanding. Not that I don't I don't get into arguments with folks about sports. I, I, I do, but I typically save those for folks that I, I feel like, oh man, yeah, this person is very well versed. They know what they're talking about, but just some random person, especially on the internet. You, you're not going to find me posting sports opinions or even things that are personal to the degree that I want to go back and forth with you. If I want to go back and forth with you, I'm going to call. I'm going to say, hey, man, let's get together and grab a bite and then we can do these verbal gymnastics. But just to be arguing for the sake of argument, that's not how I get down. That's just not the type of person that I am. So I wanted to share from the mind of Mike, which you're not going to do, is get me into a sports debate. And and so here's the other piece. Here's the other piece. So there's a component of you're not good at what you're talking about. So let's have a little bit of of grace. Then the other component that really kind of rubs me the wrong way about sports, folks are so passionate. They're so ardent. They're so exuberant about the performance of someone else where they're critical he can't catch anything he should have made that tackle but are they taking a look at their lives with a fine tooth comb it's easy to talk about the coach and what they not doing and how these folks aren't prepared and you show up for work unprepared you're out of shape You've forgotten your equipment. Like you're not spending enough time with your family. You're not excited about what's happening in your life, but you get amped up and ramped up and about what you see on the television. And again, I get part of sports is escapism. But I'm just of the opinion, let's create a life where you don't have to escape from. Well, time to transition into the best advice ever. The best advice ever was something that I learned this weekend. I sat in a training that was pretty, pretty significant, pretty inspiring. And I think over the course of the next year, I will make mention to this training because it, it it really solidified some things I had been thinking about and it gave me some new lens in which I can perceive things and, 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 and really navigate this next stage of, of my career. So I had this training. It was a, a, a storyteller's training. And the instructor made the comment. He made, he talked about personal development and the importance of personal development. One of the comments that he said was, oftentimes the average person will stop their education after college. So you get your college degree and you're done, or you may get your master's. And you're done. And and oftentimes, if people get any other continuing education, it's directly associated with their job. There's a certification that they need to get. They're trying to get this promotion. So they got to go take this 
particular class, but the leaders, the 3%, the 1%, the folks that go above and beyond the extraordinary ones that are amongst, uh, among us, the ones that are successful. One of an adage that is often said is that success leaves clues. And one of those clues is that people that are uber successful, super successful, they continue down the path of personal development. They read books, they listen to podcasts, they attend seminars, they attend workshops. They are con constantly learning and evolving and reevaluating their perspective, whether that's in their skill set, whether that's in leadership, that can be in ministry, it, it could be in a variety of things, but the idea of continuous professional development leads, yields significant benefits to folks that continue on the path of professional development. And this instructor shared this information, which I will say, share it as the best advice ever. And my, the best advice is to continual personal development. Be a stickler about developing personally. Now, this person made a comment that is kind of steep. You know, it's one where this is a very established, successful individual. And he said that you should spend 10% of your annual earnings in professional development. Now, if you're a Christian, like I am, we... There's, there's, there's teaching and I tithe. So there's an understanding that 10% of your income you, you give, you tithe, you give it to your church. Then we've also, if you've listened to anything around finance and financial literacy, there's advice to pay yourself 10%. So save 10% of your earnings and put that in an account. Now, here's an additional piece of advice that says take 10% of your earnings and spend it on personally developing yourself. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty incredible. That's a that's a pretty significant chunk. So I went and did some research. I went and looked around because I understand that money makes people uncomfortable. And I, I do I do like what he said about a percentage you say, hey, man, 10% of what I make, I'm going to spend on educating myself, taking classes for new skills. I want to develop my speaking ability. I want to develop my presentation skills, whatever, whatever you desire to improve. 10% catches some people off guard. So I say be a person that is dedicated to personal development to personal development, improve your greatest asset. And that's you. That's your, that's you, your mindset, your health, your soul, your, your, your feelings, your emotions, the way that you think. Separate from take 10% of your income, here's something that you can pay every day that doesn't necessarily come out of your bank account so that you can you can donate or donate or contribute 10% a month or 10% of your annual income to pers personal develop personal development a year or you can donate or and, not or and you can also dedicate 30 minutes a day to prof professional development you can take you can carve out 30 minutes of a day and say this 30 minutes I will take to improve myself as an individual. So you may say, Mike, what are some things I can do? I'm glad you asked. So you can take 30 minutes every day and you can read or listen to something positive. You can learn a new skill. 
or an idea, something that you are kind of working through, understanding a, a new philosophy, a, a different way of, 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 of seeing things. You can set goals. You can have that in that 30 minutes where you go and you review your goals for the month. I'm watch. I'm reading when well, I reading, but I'm listening to this this audio by Earl Nightingale, and it's I think it's titled "The Secret to Success," and it's talking about it's talking about setting goals. But I, I I'm going to my 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 endeavor. It's called "The Strangest Secret" by Earl Nightingale. It's about 31 minutes, so I go to sleep listening to it. So I wanted to permeate my thoughts. I wanted to be a part of the way I think about things. So that's important to set goals. It's important to set goals that you, you know, we've all heard of smart goals, goals that are specific, measurable, actionable, uh, re realistic, and time, timely, time bound, things that you can measure. So set goals. The other thing you can do is reflect on your life. Professional development it is self-awareness. I think that that's one of the biggest leadership traits that significantly can help individuals is to be self-aware. You'd be amazed. I mean, I've watched, I watch comedians get up and be very mediocre and come off stage and be like, man, I rocked that joint that I got ripped that piece. Like, Excuse me, were you in an, a different universe, an alternative universe? Because I did not see what you saw. Exercise. Exercise is another way for you to develop personally, to, to put yourself, your body, get your heart rate moving, blood flowing, feel good, look good. And then last but not least, write in a journal. Take, make make notes of of your of your ideas and things that you're experiencing. So the best advice, the best advice ever today is simply dedicate yourself to personal development. Well, now we're at the what you're not going to do segment. I had some thoughts recently about Juneteenth and race. And I thought about a few conversations that I wanted I wanted to share. There's a few conversations because I find myself in in spaces where you say white spaces where I'm one of a few minority members. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm, I'm there's not a lot of black dudes <laughs> in spots where I'm in, and I, I can recall I can recall a few conversations that I wish at the moment when I was asked the question that I would have gave a better answer. So a little bit of context, y'all been listening to me, you know me, I'm a black dude, black man out of Camden, South Carolina. So I, I lived a very black experience. I'm, 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 if I have a PhD in anything, it's in Southern black folks. That's I live in the South, I, I, my, my orientation is South. Not that there's not other perspectives, people from the Midwest have a different perspective on some things folks from the from the west coast now that but that's the interesting thing about uh, black folks regardless of where you from the culture when we, you know when you often hear black people talk about culture our shared lived experience there often are similarities because we were raised by people that did similar things so there's a like if you're Italian, there should be an, an, an Italian uh, shared experience. Now, oftentimes, uh, folks that are, are white or white Americans will say, what's how we don't have any culture. And I'm like, no, that's that's not true. We have American culture uh, because white folks are the primary uh, contributor or, or at least the primary subject focus in American culture. When you think in American culture you're thinking primarily uh, white or, or a Caucasian. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, to, I wanted to answer a question that someone asked me about Juneteenth. And it was like, hey, you know, I was on a, on a tour and I was, again, the, the lone black dude from 
I'm not mistaken. Might have. And the question came up about Juneteenth. We were around Juneteenth, and it was like, hey, what's the what's what's the thoughts? And oftentimes, as uh, African American, especially a person in my position, I, I've cultivated relationships, and I feel, uh, especially with, with the comedy that I do, I, it opens people up to wanting to have some some honest dialogue. So the first thing I will simply say that it's a little bit. It's a little wild, and wild is probably it's disappointing. Is maybe the word that it, when someone says race that you automatically take race, not you, but when when the word race, African American, slavery, Juneteenth, any, anything that is B T, Apollo, like if if it's something that HBCUs, it's like you automatically I keep saying you. There's an automatic feeling as though others are being excluded. And in oftentimes the truth of the matter, these other entities would not exist if African Americans were folded into the American culture from the start. There would not be HBCUs if if they were ability, if, if African Americans had the ability to attend college. I don't maybe there may may have been still some, but the 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 proliferation of HBCUs and, and why they were developed, there's a reason that we're here. There's a reason why these things exist. And I, and I don't think that you can ignore the hi- historical context of it. And I so I remember someone asked me. I was asked about Juneteenth and, and, and the importance of it to African Americans. And again, I don't speak for all black folks. We're not speaking for <laughs> all black folks. And we must acknowledge that when there are conversations around race, inclusivity, whatever those those topics are, there are some characters or individuals that don't have goodwill. They're not operating in goodwill. And I'm never thinking about those folks. Or not never thinking about those folks, but those aren't the folks that I'm I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the folks that are reasonable, Christian, hardworking folks that are, are, are really truly open to saying, man, give me some insight on this. Like what what what's what does that mean? How does how how do you express these things so again there are folks there are folks that are trying to take advantage of the system trying to get over but that's not the majority of people i believe so the question was asked about juneteenth and its its significance so a short answer simply is the challenge for black folks african americans as it relates to the the idea of america One thing that I I often, it's a little exhausting that when when, when the African-American community, black folks say something about what's not well in America, the knee-jerk reaction or or go back to Africa, you don't love America. It's this accusatory rebuke that's very odd. So like if I... If I, I love my wife, I want my marriage to be wonderful. I want it to be prosperous. I want it to be thriving. But I know I'm an imperfect person married to another imperfect person. So things aren't perfect. And we work together to find resolution. So if my wife comes to me and says, hey, when we're having conversations, your tone, you know, you, you raise your voice to me. Oh, and, and it makes me, it, I don't like it. It doesn't make me feel good. And I, I would work, hope that you would work to to be considerate of that. Think about that when we have these interactions. And I'm, all oh, this stuff I do for you. You know how many women would, would want a man like me? Like, hey, man, I just want you to work on this particular thing. If you say you love me. 
if we're in relationship, if I'm in relationship with America, from what I understand, America is the ideal. When the forefathers or the framers put together this, it's an idea. This is what we work and strive towards. That doesn't mean that in reality, some things aren't true. Like in in lived experience, it's not true. So someone asked me about Juneteenth and the significance of it. And I just simply said, the 4th of July is a little problematic. I love America. I've served in the military. So, so like, miss me with, I don't love America. There are folks that'll <laughs> rant and rave. And I'm like, did you serve? No. Hey, man. Cut it out. So I love my country. I love America. Would rather be nowhere else than where I am. In saying that, that doesn't mean that aren't things that need to be worked on and improved. And so when I think about the 4th of July and what I've talked to my children about, that's been very problematic about America when, when America was founded, whether that's July the 2nd and, you know, you start getting into, well, this day in the, but when it was established as a being, as the beacon of hope, what we understand to be America, African-Americans were deemed three fifths a person. That's facts. That's not nothing that anyone made up. That's not some conspiracy theory. That's not somebody operating in, in bad will saying, no, that's not true. African-Americans were not deemed to be full people. So there is a bit of, ah, uh, yeah, we love America, apple pie, baseball, cookout, the, the, the whole nine. Juneteenth adds that component of we're all are free. Fourth of July, some people are free. Juneteenth, everybody is free. And that's very interesting because what we love in America is freedom. Boy, if Americans don't love anything, Americans love freedom. So why is it controversial? Why is it divisive or divisive when there's a celebration of freedom for all Americans? And so that's the, that's the component. Juneteenth makes the, 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 the portion of the family that didn't really f get invited to the events when the events were first established. This is the part of the family. We say, hey, man. Hey, man, that was wrong. We shouldn't have done that. Y'all come on in and have some of these pinto beans and <laughs> corn on the cob. So that's a, a conversation I wish I would have I would have had a better perspective on in, in the moment. And no, one one more, and then I will let you go on your merry way. Another conversation I remember having was about Morgan Freeman made some comments on 60 Minutes about racism. And basically, if we ignored racism, it would go away. The only reason in racism continues to be a thing, a topic, is because we keep talking about it. If we stop talking about it, it goes away. And the person, you know, presented like, hey, well, how do you feel about this? And again, I think this was a reasonable individual person that we've, we're working together. We've established a form of a relationship. And he felt, hey, I want to ask you this question. In that moment, I didn't really have a great kind of response. I mumbled and fumbled and I said some things, but what I really would have thought to say, I wish I would have had thought to say was to a portion of our population, African-Americans primarily racism. And it, and we, we feel like it should be for everyone, but racism is like cancer. Is cancer something that you say, Hey, ignore the cancer. Let's not treat it. Let's not diagnose. Let's not say how big the tumor. Let's if just ignore the cancer. You know what? The cancer will shrivel up, shrivel up and die. It will evap evaporate into the atmosphere. That's that's not how it works. And I wish I would have in the moment said first off, when is Morgan Freeman an authority on anything separate from acting like? <laughs> He's a black man. He's old. He said it. 
we should follow it. Like there's no academic research. Morgan Freeman hadn't spent his life doing <laughs> interviews, looking at the effects of racism on stress and on your, your life expectancy, any of these things. He just said it on television and it's like, all right, yeah, we should just stop talking about it and it'll go away. That's not how sin, I think racism is a sin. And I don't think we talk about that in the context of, of it's, it's, a, it's a life. It's not life. It's a heart issue. I, I, I used to try to do this joke. It, it, <laughs> it really, it hadn't worked and I need to figure out how to make it work. But the joke is basically, he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. And it's like, yeah, that's not how racism works. He got a racist bone in his body, but he has a racist tongue in his mouth. <laughs> but people don't know when they laugh at that. That's one of the ones where they, ooh, it's kind of, I get a little, get a little sigh, a little groan. Well, man, thank y'all so much. I hopefully that gave you some insight into how I, I see things. What you're not going to do is focus on people that are not of goodwill. I'm, I'm about people of goodwill, folks that are hardworking. I think we all in life, reasonable people, want the same things. We want what America has been created to be, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what everyone wants. It just feels sometimes that that's not what everyone gets. But again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Love to hear from you. Please send me. Emails at info at comedian Mike Goodwin .com. You can like, share, and follow this podcast. You can follow me on the social media world at, at uh, Bowtie Comedy on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at comedian Mike Goodwin on Facebook and TikTok. I'm also on YouTube. Check out my special on Amazon Prime, Peacock. What you're not going to do is not laugh at these jokes. And again, thank you for tuning in this week to another episode of the Best Advice Ever podcast. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me, and I appreciate it. We'll be back next week. Same back channel, same back time, same back place. Peace!